something good and wonderful in our lives and through our lives. We should celebrate the moment, but most importantly, say to God be the glory for all the good and wonderful things that He has done. And by the way, the bulletin cover this morning was fantastic. I understand Randy picked that out. Good job, Randy. I really enjoyed that. To God be the glory for all that He has done. So one of the things that we have celebrated together is that our life together is about God. I believe when any person comes into a community of faith, whether it's in the community or whether it's into the church building, there ought to be a sense of holiness. And we celebrate that. We've also come to believe and celebrate together that the church is a body and every one of us is a part of it. There's no one of us that is dispensable. There's no one of us who is here by accident. But that God has assigned us and has woven us together. And as we bring our gifts and talents and abilities, our questions, our answers, our doubts and our fears, as we bring all of them together and throw them into the pool of a community of faith, we become one decent body to be used for Christ. For far too many years, the church has been in decline because we bought into the model that we have those leaders, whether they're pastors or teachers or whomever, who will take care of and the rest of us are those who are cared for. We as a congregation do not believe that. We believe that every one of us are knit into this body and that we all have a part. And we are thankful that we have had an opportunity to serve together. One of the things that we have learned together is that when we serve, we grow. When you sit, well, you just sit. <laughs> That's all there is to it. And thirdly, we have learned that the church is a place... That God intended to be a place where broken people come and find healing. The church is not a museum. The church is not a place for only the good people to gather. It's a place where broken people come and find God's grace and are enabled to be made whole. It's a place where everybody gathered, regardless of where they have been in their yesterdays, join hands and sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound to save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. As I sat and I thought it, it seemed to me that these were the important things that we believe together and that we have lived out together. And then I came to the conclusion that there's probably no greater example of these truths than us. And the journey we have been on, I want to draw attention to myself first. I don't like to do that very much, but I want to do that because it brings glory to God. I remember the first impression I had of this church. I was called to Springfield to meet with two superintendents. And they said to me, well, we need to tell you that your appointment has been changed. You have been appointed to the First United Methodist Church of Kiwani. I said, well, that's good. Where is it? <laughs> Never heard of Kiwani before in my life. And so they pulled out a map and they showed me where it was. And I, I said, that's fine. And, and then I remember when I came for the interview. I pulled in the back parking lot and, and I saw a sign that you don't even notice anymore. And I don't notice it now, but I noticed it then. And on that sign, these words are, are printed. I encourage you to read it. This, is, this parking lot belongs to the First United Methodist Church of Kiwani. It's for our purposes, but when we're not using it, you can feel free to use it. Now, that's a loose paraphrase, but what it really meant was exactly that. It's our lot, but if we're not using it, you go ahead. You're welcome. I remember celebrating inside of myself saying, I want to be a part of a church who will put up a sign like that. Because of far too many times, both in parking lots and in meeting rooms and in other places, I have seen the sign in churches, all unauthorized vehicles will be towed. <laughs> we don't want your car here. We don't want your thoughts here. We don't want your attitudes here if they don't fit ours. And all of a sudden I saw that sign that said, we're not using it to go right ahead. And it began to warm my heart. Many of you know, and I want to share with you again this morning, that when I became your pastor nine years ago, I came to you and I needed a church. I needed a church at its best and not as, at its worst. I've been through a difficult time in life. It ended in a divorce and near bankruptcy. I came here, as you will remember, single and cynical. Yet God had not set me free from the calling that he put on my life when I was 15 years old to be his preacher. Oh, had he set me free, I would have turned and had ran as fast as I could because I'd been wounded in ways that nobody fully understood. I came with the attitude that if it works, great, and if not, good, then I'll go do something else with my life. 
And I want you to know that God knew what he was doing when he sent me into your midst. You accepted me and gave me grace and mercy. You didn't ask a lot of painful and difficult questions. I simply went to work serving God with you. And I tried as I wrote this sermon to find the words to describe how healing that has been, but the words would just not come. All I can simply say is that you helped me find myself and you helped me find ministry. You helped put me back together again in very wonderful and powerful ways. And then three and a half years after I came here, I remember the day that I had Sarah march down front under her objection. <laughs> and I held up her hand and said, God has blessed me with a new partner in life and we announced our engagement. Came with an empty house and ended up with a full house. <laughs> Tiffany came as a new daughter. Then my daughter, then my grandkids. And I thought, boy, those days when I sat here lonely, those seem so wonderful right now. <laughs> but in the midst of all of those changes, the important thing is that you embraced me and my family and the whole that we were and all the ups and the downs. And you shared with us the God's grace. And not only that, whether you know it or not, you gave me the freedom to share in the new ministry model. Before I came here, I was a pastor 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I thought it impressed God, and I thought it was really helping the church, but all it really did was hurt me, and probably didn't bring much glory to God. Two and a half years before I came here, at the age of 42, I went through uh, cardiac bypass surgery, and it was all because I didn't know how to say no. But when I came here... I decided to let God be in charge of his church. It was hard for us to accept that change. But you were gracious and you were kind. And we serve God together. And we now understand what it means to be a body of Christ. You allowed me to make this my home. Many of you have heard me say, and I'll say it again, that I've lived in Kiwani longer than any place in my entire life. Not just in ministry, but in my entire life. Ever since I first remember my first conscious thought, your parsonage has housed me longer than any other house. It is my home. In short, what I'm really trying to say to you is that I suspect that I'm the most obvious example of God working in your midst. Taking broken pieces. And healing. With his own mighty hand, but also with the hands of good and faithful and loving people. I'm a little bit numb this morning because I'm in denial. I haven't accepted that this is the last time we'll be together. And in two weeks, I'll be standing before another group of people saying, who are you people? <laughs> and you'll be having a new pastor stand before you and you'll be saying, who is this guy? We'll deal with those emotions when that time comes. But this, I'm sure, God is in charge. And I'm thankful for the grace and mercy and healing that I have received from being a pastor of this congregation. Now I want to draw attention to you. Not only have I been transformed, but so have you. God has been busy in our midst. I can say that this is not the same congregation that it was in 2002. God has been working in our midst. I remember the first few Sundays I was here looking over the congregation and asking myself a serious question. And that question was this. And it was based on my belief that the church is a place where broken and hurting people can come to find help. And I asked myself the question, if God did send a hurting and broken people of, if the hurting and broken people of Kiwani to this congregation, could we really at this moment receive them? Would we do them more harm or would we do them more good? My understanding was that the church is like a nursery where babies are dropped off and we have to know how to change them and to feed them and to take care of them and to help them nurture, not let them sit and fail to thrive. And I asked the serious question, are we ready if God were to send a busload of hurting and broken people, would we know what to do with them? I doubted that we really were ready for that. I doubted that I was really ready for that. So we began a journey which we called making disciples no matter what it takes. And we did it in a lot of ways. But the whole goal was helping all of us who are already here grow not only in our width of faith, but in our depth of faith. Trusting in God in ways that we have never trusted in Him before. And slowly but surely, God's Spirit began to work in our midst. And we began to grow and we began to serve and we began to reach out in ways 
we've prayed, we've studied, we've worked together, and we've given God the glory for it all. And something began to happen to us. We began to understand what God was doing in our midst. People began to serve in ways they'd never served before. Lay speakers began to speak. Committees began to lead. And spirits began to grow. And then all of a sudden something miraculous started happening. Slowly but surely, God prepared our hearts to care for the others who who had come our way, who had not heard about the love of Christ. And then not only did He prepare us, but He began to send those new people. Who wanted to know what it meant to love God, to serve God, to be touched by His grace. And you as a congregation have sharpened your skill, have sharpened your faith, so that when somebody new comes in, you pray for them, you care for them, you invite them, you nurture them, and you tell them your own weaknesses and faults, and somehow God is at work in our midst, and all we can say is, to God be the Lord. In the last nine years, we have changed the spirit, but we've also changed the number. We have had to say goodbye to some friends who went to heaven ahead of us. And I think I can speak for all of us. When you stop to think about the folks that we've had to say goodbye to, we really miss those people. And I look forward to the day when I'm going to get to see some of them again, don't you? And we're going to be gathered together in God's kingdom. But in that same time when we've had to say goodbye, we've had how many new friends to say hello? Who have come and have joined hearts and hands with us and have refilled the shoes that were left empty. The congregation is not the same anymore. And so in conclusion, I simply want to affirm that it really is about God. God has been in our midst. He has touched us. He has shaped us. He has molded us. He's become a part of us. And guess what? His work is not yet finished. And I want to invite you and I want to invite me and my family and all of us to keep our eyes on the Master. When Paul came to the conclusion of his writings and he had to say goodbye to the Christians at Corinth, he said this. He said, finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. But that's not all he said. Here he said, aim for protect, or aim for perfection. Make holiness, make God your aim in life. He said, be of one mind. Unity is important. Let nothing divide you or separate you. Live in peace. The evil one wants to stir up controversy, but do not give in. And lastly, he said, and may the God of love be with you. What a great blessing. For anybody to share with another person. I want to give you these same words and directions. And I want to receive them from you. God has appointed us to a new place. God has appointed you a new pastor. Honor and pray. And seek God in the days that will come. And I just have this belief. Even though if you've talked to me. I'll tell you I'm a little anxious about my new appointment. I just have this belief. That God will not lead us where he will not also sustain. So finally, I just want to thank you this morning for the great work that God has done in you in my life. And I want to thank you for the good words that I hear from you. It's a little overwhelming to me because I just want you to know I know me. I'm a frail, fragile human being. And when I hear your stories, I could easily come to another conclusion. Don't worry. Don't. God is in our midst. And so thank you again for the journey, for the time, for the blessings. And may God be glorified in all the days that are ahead. Let us pray together. Oh God, I thank you for this opportunity to stand before your people this morning and share these words. I pray that in some way that you will allow them not to just make it to our ears, but to our hearts, because the message is about you, about what you have done in us and through us. Oh, we thank you for the opportunities we've had to touch each other's lives. And we don't in any way want to make light of those. And so we pause this morning to thank you for the past and to trust you in the future. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ.